does this oil leg have, does this oil bounce have legs? We should just we should just kill this right now. Tony and I have been both been struggling with technology. <laughs> I'm struggling to talk. Hi everyone, welcome to Real Fish and Daily Briefing. With me today is Tony Greer, editor of the Morning Navigator newsletter. Hi there, Tony. It's just the way this week is, isn't it? It sure is, Maggie. Which leg of the market do you want to talk about today? We, well, you know what? We're going to talk about all of them because it feels like one of those days where things are just kind of churning underneath. But I think it's going to get interesting pretty soon, but everyone's trying to figure out how to navigate it. In fact, so many people we've had on have said, this is, a, this is a tough market. I know what it's not, but I don't know what it is yet. I'm just kind of trying to look and watch. And I know a lot of them are watching the technicals because the fundamentals are so confusing. So let's try to try to jump in and walk through some of it. And we can start with stocks. It's the last trading day of the month. It's been a down one for stocks. They were kind of churning around today. S and P, though, drifting lower into the close. Um, what are you watching? Are you are, are are there technicals? Is there a technical story that's important here? What what do you what are you keeping an eye on for the S and P? Well, to go back to where you started, Maggie, with with all of the confusion and struggling to figure out what's going on, I think that's people realizing that the curve is literally the twos tens curve is nearly minus a hundred basis points where we haven't seen it in this century. So that's definitely going to throw a little bit of uh, confusion into the trading day. It usually means that, you know, there's some kind of bad economic data around the corner. It usually means that there is potential stock waterfall around the corner and mm -hmm. bad news and things like that. So that's what the I'm calling it the sort of nonlinear chaotic market that we're living through this year. Um, my friend Brent Donnelly says that it's a mean reversion year, and that sounds kind of right to me. Um, you know, today the S&P is just kind of bobbling either side of 4K. We had that big option expiration last week. But I think when you look back on it and take a step back and look at it from sort of call it the month of February, Maggie, you know, we got headline inflation out. It looks like it was a little bit hotter for a little bit longer. What happened in the market? Bonds sold off, stocks sold off, yields are higher. You know, twos went from uh, where did twos go from? Uh, three excuse me 450 to 480 excuse me 4.9 percent 420 to 480 percent this month that's a huge move in the short end of the curve um you know kind of took the piss out of a lot of equity sectors i mean gold stocks fell 15 percent in in uh the month of february uh it was really really sloppy month so you know i'm trying to figure it out just like the next guy and i think that the way to do it is to sort of latch on to the trades that you're comfortable sleeping at night through Mm -hmm. um, for, for me, that's a lot of stuff in the natural resources sector, because if rates are going higher, generally speaking, I don't want to be long too much technology. And, um, you know, that's really the way I'm sorting it out right now, Maggie. I think the energy markets are constructive. The, the base metal markets are holding in, we can call it. And other than that, the commodity trade has been really difficult. The Bloomberg Commodity Index off 5% last month. Yeah. You know, you know, double digit losses in diesel fuel, aluminum, silver. I mean, that's not inflationary stuff, you know, but I think that's what the uh, the factor of higher rates is. And that's why everybody's so confused. You know, if, we sh if we're going to be seeing this extended inflation, you would expect the commodity markets to come barking back every day. And most of them are literally just kind of sitting around on their butts right now from natural gas to grains to um, you know, aluminum and zinc and things like that. So it's a really, really confusing landscape to try to sort out. Yeah, no, that's that's a, a really great way to explain it. Nothing seems to be working except cash. I mean, that's what we because you're getting paid to sit in cash now. Cryptocurrency. So, you get paid to sit in cryptocurrency. It's up 40 percent on the year. That's right. That's right. Even in this, even when we saw the sell off in risk assets, you didn't that's see right. that happen, which is super interesting. Uh, right. Just just. Just a note for everyone, by the way, we were joking because we were really scrambling around with some technical problems ahead, uh, ahead of this. And I'm not sure if the chat is working on our platform or not. It might be, maybe it's just me lagging, but if it's not um, and you have a question, you can put them in YouTube. If you're on YouTube already, go ahead and put your questions in there for Tony and we'll get to as many as we can, or you can tweet us at Real Vision. Um, so Tony, when we're looking at oil, we, we started with the question about oil. Um, because we did, you know, there was this, it's, it's been, it's a mixed picture today because we did see crude prices up, but energy stocks were one of the laggards with utilities for equities. So if we look at crude prices themselves, start with the commodity, um, 
what are you seeing there? Is this sort of China demand story going to turn up here? Is that for real? Or what, what's driving the action for the commodity itself? So in terms of the energy market, in terms of the commodity and the stocks, what's been going on is that the equities are outperforming the commodity dramatically right now. Right. The commodity has been sideways. It, it loves the, the prices between 75 and 80. Um, you know, it's got tailwinds of China reopening. It's got headwinds of, you know, SPR sales and all kinds of things and, and a weakening economy. So there's there's push and pull on the oil market where it feels like it kind of likes these prices right now. What's been going on in the in the stocks because things like crack spreads are still remaining extremely bid, which are keeping the bull market in refiners alive. Um, you're seeing definitely you're seeing pe money come out of, believe it or not, a lot of the XLE ETFs while the stocks continue to go higher. Mm. So the, the stocks are leading. And what happened this morning was simply oil got you know off on a nice run. It got up above its 50 day moving average, which keeps doing down here on this dip. And right on the stock opening, oil was on its highs. And so everybody bid all the stocks up right through yesterday's high to a new high for the move or sort of slightly above the range. And what happened was those were met with selling and the selling came all day long. Mm. Right? So all it did was set those stocks back to where they came from. There were a couple of outside reversals that you can certainly be wary of. If you're bullish, that could be a little bit of a turnaround to the downside there technically. But that, that I think, explains what went on today in energy equities. Mm, interesting. Uh, yeah. I saw that Chevron, for one, I'm not sure if, if they're all doing it, but Chevron announced it's going to up its share buyback outlook. Um, they're doing what, like uh, between 10 and 20 billion per year. Those seem like big numbers. Yeah, those numbers are sticking a finger in the eye of the Biden administration. If you ask me, it's saying we're not going to invest in, you know, exploration and production. We're going to sit around and wait till the next investment cycle. And we're going to sit here and buy our stock back while we wait. You know, I think that sends a really strong message given what's going on here and given that the administration is accusing them of gouging gas prices, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They're saying, OK, you can keep doing your thing and we'll do our thing over here and we'll pivot to carbon capture and storage and we'll make money in our refinery business and we'll continue to hold off on e &P, But we will buy our stock back until we get a new election cycle that lets us put a drill in the ground. Yeah, you'd think that put would, would be supportive or put some sort of floor under prices, right? Yeah, you would think so. And, you know, given the fact that we've still got pretty low inventory levels across the oil complex, it is amazing that oil has remained at these depressed levels. So I still think it's got upside. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Is there is there it's it's uh it seems like it's well, it's hard. Listen, it's hard. It's hard to know. I, think, I guess everyone's trying to gaze where we are at the business cycle to try to figure out what the demand picture is going to look like. Yeah, I'm not a biologist, so I have I have a tough time with that, Maggie. But I do yeah. know that global gasoline demand just recently t touched a new high, um, which is totally relevant. And that's part of, I think, what's throwing off some of the people looking for a recession, therefore meaning that, you know, commodity prices and stock prices have to crash. You know, I feel like the market already saw the recession and, um, I'm not as concerned about it going forward, whether we do or not. I don't necessarily think that it has to mean that we're going to see a dip in gasoline demand. And so that's why I can stay with the fossil fuel sector. Mm. Uh, we got a couple of questions about the dollar. People curious about what you're looking at for U.S. dollar. I'm starting to fade it. You know, it's it's been an interesting counter trend rally for the entire month of February. The dollar index, to use that as a proxy, has been, you know, behaving beautifully technically. You know, all it did was get oversold into the beginning of the month and retraced through some moving averages. And now it's heading toward the 100 and 200 day moving average resistance levels up above around 106. Um, co not coincidentally, the rally has slowed down, if you notice, as we kind of reach up toward those prices. And I have a feeling that somewhere, you know, in the next couple of weeks, in the next couple of percent, that's where the dollar fails and probably resumes its trip lower. I'm still, Maggie, operating off of a base case whereby the two central bank interventions last year, the Bank of England and then the Bank of Japan, those marked the top in the dollar. The narrative picked up about a lot of central bank digital currencies after that as the path continued lower. And it still feels like 
there are, you know, the purchasing power of the dollar is weaker. And I don't want to talk about it like it's an in- intraday thing, mm. but it's very real. The fact that, you know, Russia, Saudi Arabia, China, India are looking at pricing commodities and other currencies. And I think that can contribute, broadly speaking, to dollar weakness over time as well. Mm. Now, if, it, if, if, if we had a question if it goes through 106, 107 on DXY, will metal still be able to rally? But you're fading it thinking it's going to go lower. So do you see any reaction in the metal space from that? Look at XME the last two days has been the top of the leaderboard, right? It's been led by steel stocks, steel and aluminum today. Century Aluminum and Big Steel have both had big rallies today to lead XME. Um, it's got it's loaded with coal stocks. It's loaded with names like Freeport Macaran. And if the copper story ever works out, you know, there'll be leadership from those stocks in there. I'm looking for XME to be one of the better performers, the industrial metals and mining sector, to be one of the better performers in the year once the year shakes out. You know, right now we're battling um, year to date performance with the semiconductor sector and with airlines. You know, those are all up above 10, 12 percent. And I think that given the position of XME and metals and mining, I think that they've got a longer runway to rally, quite Mm -hmm. honestly, than transports or semiconductors do this year. So that's just my opinion. We'll see if it continues to pan out. But the last two days, it's been conspicuously at the top of the sector leaderboard up over 2% a day, and it's bouncing off a critical support. So those are the types of signs that you look like uh, you look for as a trader to confirm that you're in the right names and probably can get bigger if you want to. Yeah, interesting, really interesting point. Uh, You mentioned copper. I wanted to play a clip from the investor tutorial that Jamie McDonald recently just did on copper. Let's have a listen and then we'll talk a little bit more about copper after. Traders and analysts often refer to copper as the metal with a PhD in economics or Dr. Copper and with good reason. The price of copper has an uncanny ability to predict turning points in the business cycle. And this is down to its widespread use in most areas of the economy, be it homes or factories, electricity, transmission, construction, electronics, the list goes on. To give you a flavor of how copper is utilized in major sectors, analysis by the Copper Development Association or CDA estimates that 46% of copper is consumed by building construction, 21% goes to electricals, 16% to transportation, and around 17% ends up in consumer products and industrial machinery. This breakdown gives you an idea of where the metal gets its nickname. Simply put, a rise in copper orders will be supportive of the copper price. Increasing orders indicates that industrial production is on the up and the broader economy is in good health. However, If industrial activity slows, copper orders are more likely to be delayed or cancelled due to projects being deferred or dropped altogether, and as a result, the copper price will fall. It is copper's wide-ranging use as a fundamental raw material that can make it a useful leading indicator of the economy more generally. Okay, I'm back. Don't worry. We're we're still we're still smoothing out the technical stuff, but we're getting there. So, Tony, I mean, I mean, that's that's really interesting um, from Jamie about sort of how it fits into the business cycle. But uh, talk to me about, by the way, that entire tutorial, which is really worth a listen, is on our website. As you guys know, just hit the QR code and you can find out how you can join our community. So um, talk to me about what, what you're watching in Copper. How do you feel about that right now? You know, it's it's impossible not to be bullish copper as a commodity trader right now. You know, you're looking to the pivot to electronic vehicles, you know, constantly needing more copper use. And you look at copper inventories on the LME and they are a path from the top left hand corner of your screen to the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, They're near historic lows and the price isn't it isn't near historic highs. So it's backed off of that 10, 11 K level. you know, sort of with the whole commodity disinflation sell off from last year, um, it held a super critical level. I mean, I'm on the tape here in the Real Vision Daily Briefing talking about how it held the 2018 highs at 6,500 on the LME, pounding it time and time again last year. So for me, this is the year that copper breaks out technically. Um, But because it's a year of nonlinear chaos, 
If you have situations like we had last week where while copper is in, in, in an uptrend trying to break out, it decides to turn around one day and have a multi-sigma slide through moving average support that really, really throws off your picture. You know, you're sitting here trading it from a bull perspective. The, the price action looks great. The headlines look great. Everything is coming together. And out of the blue, the bottom falls out. But if you see by the chart that uh, we shared earlier, it looks like it's regained 50-day moving average today. It's back in range and therefore can continue higher again. So, you know, technically speaking, it's been difficult, but has remained in an uptrend enough for you to stay with a bullish trade in copper. So, that's how I'm looking at it, and that's how I'm trying to kind of squeeze my legs together and stay in the trade this year. Yeah, it is. It is just so tough. Are you? Are you? I mean, you're. You. You know, you have your long, your your long term stuff that you do, but I know a lot of the stuff we talk about. You you are more trader oriented. You're short term. Are you even more short term given all this uncertainty? How do you approach an environment like this where literally everyone's coming on and saying, "I know what it's not, but I have no." sight into the future at all. I, I just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, Maggie, your posture as a trader has to change, doesn't it? You know, it, it would be under normal market conditions when things are going well for you and your positions are working and things are looking good. You tend to kind of sit back and observe and say, man, you know, let's let this all happen. I think I got this right. Right. And as soon as I get that feeling this year, I sell something. <laughs> Because yeah. it's already it's already happened five, six, seven, eight times where I've done that sort of take a step back and kind of admire the position that I'm in. And then all of a sudden the next day I'm, I'm minus seven percent on the same position and I'm uh, you know up against the stop loss wondering if I should get out. You know, so it's the kind of thing where, yeah, I trade a little bit more often than I have been trading. I have been very hasty to take profits, whether it's right or wrong. I don't care. I'm taking the money and I'm running. Um, because I know that something is going to give me a black eye when I wake up tomorrow morning. So yeah. it's, lit it's literally a lot more of a game of let me, you know, steal this money while I got the profit on the table and hope that I don't wake up with a set of broken ribs tomorrow because that keeps happening to me no matter what. It's happening to everybody. That's the problem. It's happening to everyone. Um, I, I, Achilles, I think that answered your question a little bit. He was asking, um, at what point do charts override a fundamental thesis? You some people try not to get married to a th fundamental thesis and and yeah. just look at the price action, right? Yeah, my chart always overrides my fundamental thesis because the last sale is is what's right. So I've been extremely disciplined with my stops this year. When it goes through my level, I trade with no emotion. I forget about my fundamental view and I get the flock out of the birdcage. You know, and that's the only way to do it, because if you want to be sitting around when the good opportunities come along and when the gravy train comes by, you got to have a lot of dry powder for that. And that means, you know, taking your 10 percent losses on a, on a position here and taking 8 percent losses there and saying, I can't have this turn into 2530. That'll bury me on the year. So, you know, when we're not playing with really much of the house's money this year, I mean, I managed to scalp a couple of trades because that's how I demand that I start off the year. But I haven't been able to make much many. I haven't been able to earn very many basis points in the last six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I think that speaks to how difficult it is. Bo asking, do you trade momentum more than value? Um, in terms of price action? Yeah. You know, like I'm not really a value trader in terms of, uh, you know, picking out valuable stocks that are undervalued. You know, I'm more of you know, I obviously have to have some kind of a bullish fundamental scenario, but I'm about finding trends, you know, and, and when you find bullish trends, no matter what they are, you know, you pick your spots and get in. And, and so I used to be a lot more of a momentum chaser. And my friend Tom Thornton has kind of calmed me down from that. You know, understanding when things are exhausted has been a great addition to my sort of trading technique. And where I normally would have been at you know, it's not I say normally where maybe 10 years ago I would have been adding to a position on strength when I see that, you know, Tom has things overbought and looking like exhaustion signals show up. Mm -hmm. I usually look out for that and say, oh, maybe I'll sell something instead up here and look to double down on the dip. You know, so it's really it's um, I've changed my strategy quite a bit. I do consider myself a momentum trader, but I consider myself sort of a uh, much sharper one than I used to be. I used to be a sort of head through the wall momentum trader. 
um, where you know you kind of wanted to buy every higher price on the screen. You wanted to put up new high prints to see what happened. And now I can sort of take my time and let the high prints trade, maybe sell something and then really upsize on a dip if I can. Yeah, that's great stuff. It, it's great, I think, really helpful for people to hear about that strategy because it matters. Uh, Spencer yeah. asking, do you think the 10-year yield will rise to narrow the aversion or will the 210 continue to widen out due to longer term inflation expectations? Are you looking at the yield curve like that at all, Tony? Yeah, the two cents curve is why we're in this chaotic period of nothing linear, right? I mean, we're at minus 85 basis points or so, you know, and just for some context, we didn't dip below like minus 40 basis points or so before um, before the dot-com crash mm -hmm. and before the great financial crisis. The curve got way inverted and I only think went as deep as 30 to 50 basis points. So down here at 85, I have no freaking idea what's going to happen to tighten it. My sense is if I'm going to stick with my view that I think that commodity inflation is going to continue to hold the Fed's hand to the fire, and now it turns out it's headline inflation at the moment and not commodity inflation, mm -hmm. um, but I think that that might swing back. So I guess to get back to my point, if I'm going to remain bullish commodities and think that inflation is going to remain higher for longer, then I'm going to say that the curve is going to close up by tens rising. Yeah, that, that's really what I think. I don't see a scenario where all of a sudden the short end is going to be able to nosedive with full confidence that, you know, there's no inflation and a stronger uh, economy. I just feel like that those are two uphill battles to try to come up with that scenario right now. So if you had a you know, gun to my head, I would have to say I think tens catch up in that flattening scenario. Uh, do you think that the Fed's framework is flawed? as they try to get their head, you know, get, get a handle on inflation? I feel like they're, um, you know, this, this time around dealing, dealing with the inflation story, it's like they're forced to pick up the pieces. You know, they've, they've been able to be much more in control. You know, even when they're, even during the great financial crisis, it seemed like, you know, they're, they're, what had to happen was going to happen with the banks and things like that. And then they managed their way out of it kind of miraculously. I know there's a lot of side stories we could tell about that, but yeah. the bottom line is like, I try not to get too caught up in the Fed being out of control or having lost control. You know, to me, they sort of, you know, they, they may look dumb as a fox when they do it, but they sort of control the market narrative fairly well in terms of they're battling inflation, they've got to raise rates, and they're trying to do it without tanking the stock market, and so far that's working. Yeah. And so how do they do that? They get people to think that they're gonna tank the stock market for a couple of months and let them really believe that and let them position themselves that way. And then this way, when something comes out and it's not the worst possible outcome, next thing you know, stocks are off the bottom, but nothing changed in the economy. Right. So they do at some level, they do a pretty good job of managing things. And I don't write anybody off for dead when they control money supply. You know, so if they control money supply, they control a whole lot of what's going on in the financial plumbing. And so while I think it may be challenging for them to deal with the inflation that the administration is no undoubtedly causing, you know, they're just forced to pick up the pieces. So they're in a really tough spot. And uh, I think we can acknowledge that and just kind of, you know, understand that going in. Yeah. And, and and everybody's coming out of this unprecedented COVID lockdown that nobody can nobody could model for. I mean, it's never happened before. You know, uh, on the inflation front, by the way, if, in case anyone missed this, we had inflation readings in France and Spain both surprised on the upside too. increasing bets. The ECB is going to have to be more aggressive as well. Given all this uncertainty, do you think that we're going to see volatility pick up? I mean, the VIX has been pretty pretty muted. Would you do you expect that's going to change anytime soon? You know, I had to say, man, yeah, I'm not going to I don't kind of expect the VIX to change. I just sit in the front row with the full popcorn and a liter of Coca-Cola and I watch it like a hawk, you know, and all I can tell you that right now, even given the blown up pipelines and the fifth generation warfare that we're in the middle of and the nuclear saber rattling, the VIX does not care. Right. So that's the one thing that makes me sleep better at night because I'm starting to care about the saber rattling and the pipelines blowing up and what could potentially be the response and et cetera, et cetera. But if the VIX is not going to care about it, then I can't. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I still I, I, you know, I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of OK being long commodities here and willing to babysit those positions 
because I feel like there is some kind of an event that explodes the VIX coming up, right? I don't know what it is. I'm not going to want to look and find out when I wake up why oil is 95 bid one morning. I just have a feeling that the market is set up for that. You know, so if, if that's my gut and I'm willing to wear a little downside and, and, and trade it if I have to, but that, that's kind of the feeling that I get about the markets right now. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that the VIX didn't go above 23 on this last sell off here. Um, maybe that's all the market adjusting that needed to happen after that last CPI number. And maybe we get back on our feet and rally again. You know, yeah. that's what the VIX is telling me by not popping off into the 30s when it sells off with, with a lot of momentum. You know, so it's a little bit tricky, but man, I don't, I don't expect the VIX to change, Maggie. I just sit here and watch. Yeah, it's 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 been so interesting. A lot of people are scratching their heads about that. Uh, SAS Finance asking, saying, Tony, I've enjoyed the price appreciation in my Bitcoin position. I do have some concern. The move is overdone at this point. I'm out. I sold my Bitcoin. I made 18% on an Ethereum ETF in like three weeks. Um, I got tired of the volatility and I sold it. And that is part of the strategy of, you know, when you make 18% in three weeks on a position and you're struggling with everything else, the 18% looks great. Let's take it off the table and now figure out how to handle the rest of these disasters that go in every which direction every day. So I'm concerned too that that might have just been a, a brief short covering rally in my heart. I really don't believe that unless the Fed goes zero interest rates and full spigot with liquidity, that there's going to be another really raging bull market in crypto. I really don't believe that there is. So I'm happy to trade it when and be an opportunist when it looks good. And if it works out, great. You know, that that's kind of my approach to it right now. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, we do a crypto daily briefing every day and um, Ash and, and uh, the team are all over and Elaine are all, all watching these moves um, and have people on commenting on that. So SAS, if you need to check it out every day, uh, that one is live as well, midday. Uh, this is Colin, by the way, saying yesterday saw a major VIX call option activity in May and June 50 strike. Is that, is that that big player, that 50 cent I heard? folks talking about i don't know colin if that's what you're you see that same stuff tony were you watching that no i mean i haven't really heard about popular options plays since icon spent five yards on some downside protection that was kind of exciting and kind of went his way which was cool but no i don't know anything about this this last story that you mentioned i really don't unfortunately yeah colin colin we'll ask we'll, we'll ask about that um i think i think i saw something on that uh squeaking one more in i think um i uh, this is very specific. So this is uh, Maui. Uh, opinion on WTI Contango out through June 23rd. Thoughts, Tony? And will energy equities hold oil down to 65? Yeah, there's some there's some heaviness in the short end of the curve. There's kind of we've been calling it the kinky Contango because there's a couple of bends in it. Um, Broadly speaking, the whole calendar is still backward dated, but there are a couple of months and a couple of spreads that are in Contango. It's tough for me to explain when inventories are this low. It it usually has to do with you know lopsided positioning, which I don't think that we have right now on the long side when the longs have to roll and it kind of knocks all the spreads down beyond their sort of natural price. Um, I don't have a good answer for that, but I am impressed, however, that flat price is hanging in while that dynamic developed. And so it's kind of encouraging me that that's going to work itself out into, into something more normally steepened. And we'll see what happens going forward. It's definitely an anomaly, though. It's kind of weird to me as well. I'm not really sure how to approach it. But as long as the things that I'm trading aren't scared of it, I'm not going to be either. So, Tony, I think you 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 know laid out a, a really strong case of the fact that it's really hard to figure out what's going on right now. There's a lot of strange things going on in the market. But you, if you're of the belief that we're going to inflation is going to stay sticky, you still like commodities. XME looks like it's well positioned. And if you're looking at the yield curve, that inversion is frightening given we, what we know historically. But it's your best guess, given how you feel about inflation, that we're going to see the 10-year uh, side of it move up. Yes, that's fair. And I should also just say that I have no credit positions on at the moment whatsoever, and I have no risk and no skin in that game at all. So that's just me thinking out loud. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is a time to be short and careful and take your money when you can get it. 
for sure. <laughs> Tony, always so great to catch up with you. Thank you so much. And thanks for all of you for once again, uh, riding with us with a couple of the bumps at the beginning. Um, just like the market, the technology is fraught these days, but we're going to get, we're going to make it through. Uh, yes. great to see y'all. Great to see you, Tony. Have a fantastic rest of the week. Same to all of you. We'll see you back here. Same time tomorrow. In the meantime, take care and good luck out there.